now going to look at titrations and indicators. Before we do, please remember the pH scale is a log scale. So any pH value is 10 times different to the one either side of it. So if I have a pH of 1, that would be 10 times the H plus concentration of a pH 2. If I compare, for example, a pH of 1 with pure water, which is pH 7, there would be a 10 to the 6 times difference, a million times more H pluses in the pH 1. Anyway, titration curves. Titration curves are essentially used to show the progress of a reaction where we simply monitor the pH as we add acid or alkali to the solution in the conical flask. Most of the time, they show titration curves with alkali being added to acid, but don't be surprised if they show it the other way around as well. So, let's say for argument's sake now, we are starting with um, some hydrochloric acid, HCl, in our conical flask. It's got a concentration of 0.1 mole per litre, and we're using 20 ml of it. Let's say the alkali, the OH minus, is also the same concentration, 0.1 moles per litre. So, if I have a 0.1 mole, solution, mole per litre solution of HCl, the pH, as we saw in a video a moment ago, would be 1. So, on the scale here, if we put, say, 7 there, and then that would take us up to about 14. So we'd start down there at 1. And then as we add the alkali, the base, the alkali, pretty much the same thing, to the acid, you will see the pH gradually start to rise. Now it will gradually rise, and then all of a sudden, it will shoot up and do that at the end. Now effectively, this volume here represents the equivalence point of the titration and that would be 20 mil because the concentrations are the same they react one to one so therefore the volumes will be the same as well now this big change in ph the so-called vertical section of the curve is what we look at when we use um, for choosing an indicator and I'll come back to that in just a moment. Let's show you a different curve, first of all. Let's say now we want to do a, uh, a weak acid with a strong base. Now, if this was a weak acid, let's say we have something like um, ethanoic acid, CH3COH, and again, 0.1 molar, and again, 20 mil of it. So, since it's a weaker acid, it would start at a higher pH. And it would follow almost exactly the same kind of curve. So it would go up and then it would do this and then over there like so. So again, there would be a vertical section. That should be vertical, guys. Pardon my drawing skills. That, that vertical section there is clearly not as big as the vertical section in the first one because the pH started obviously higher. And then let's say we do a third reaction and let's say now we, we start with our HCl again but instead of adding a strong base like NaOH we're going to add a weak base like ammonia so the weak base like ammonia would be again 0.1 mole per litre and again we are adding the weak base to the strong acid the HCl so we start with obviously the pH down here, so it would follow the same line and it would then go up, but it would then tail off at a much lower pH than before. So those are the three possible titration curves that you're likely to get questions on. The fourth possibility would be the weak base with the weak acid, in which case, of course, it would follow that sort of line and it'd be virtually no vertical section, in fact, my graph makes it look like there is a little bit of vertical. The reality is there wouldn't be any vertical section at all. So what about using indicators to detect 
the equivalence point of the titration. We may also ask you, what's the difference between equivalence point and end point? The equivalence point is where the acid and the base completely cancel each other out. The end point is the value of this when the indicator changes color. So they're effectively the same thing, but they are defined slightly differently. Again, in my revision guide, all of that is dealt with. Okay, so on page 14 of your data book, and again, you hopefully have got this by the side of you because you need it at all times. On page 14 of the data book, there is a list of some common indicators. They also have their pKa values in with them, and that tells you approximately what, what pH they change color. Now, also in that table is their range, because indicators don't just change color at a specific pH. They start changing color at a pH, and then they change color over maybe a unit or two of pH, and then they become the other color. So the indicator would be one color and then another color. And the range of the indicator will determine which indicator is needed for the different titrations. If it's a strong acid with a strong base, because there's such a large change in pH, many indicator ranges will fit on that. Therefore, you can pretty much get away with pretty much any indicator for a strong acid and a strong base. But you've got to be much more careful if you're using a weak acid with a strong base because a low range indicator isn't going to work. You need an indicator whose range is somewhere in that section there. Off the top of my head, phenolphthalein is a classic example of such an indicator. It has a range of just over 8 to about 10. So in this one there, phenolphthalein would be around about there, meaning that before that last drop of al alkali came in, it was still on the acidic side, showing the, the acidic color. And after the drop came in, the pH would be up here, so it would now be showing its alkaline color. If you, on the other hand, had a strong acid with a weak base, now we'd be following this curve. And now that high range indicator phenolphthalein would not be in use. Now you'd need a low range indicator like methyl orange or methyl red, because their range would sit around about there. Now hopefully you've got the data book and you're looking at these ranges. You can see phenolphthalein has a high range and methyl orange or methyl red have low ranges. When you are using a particular acid and a particular alkali, you have to see, are they strong? Are they weak? What will the pH at the end point change look like? Will it be a big pH change, in which case we probably can use several indicators? Or will it be a much smaller pH change, in which case you'd have to choose the indicator whose range was on that vertical section. The final one, of course, the weak acid and the weak base doesn't have a vertical section at all. Therefore, there is no indicator which can detect those endpoints accurately. Uh, it seems like I perhaps um, jumped the gun a bit when I said this would be fine doing calculus like this. Um, some, some of my students said, no, it's not fine. We need to see how it's done. So if you were doing a titration between sodium hydroxide and sulfuric acid, and you know the volume and concentration of the alkali, and you know the volume of the acid, and the question says, calculate its concentration, then it's a simple stage-by-stage -stage process you first of all need the equation, obviously, because you need to know the stoichiometry, the ratio between the two reactants. You would then do a simple approach. First of all, you would work out the number of moles of the given substance, the one that you know all the information on. Uh, the volume is 20 mil, the concentration is 0.1. Number of moles is given by concentration times volume. But if this is in moles per liter, then that must be in liters as well. Otherwise, you can't, obviously, you can't mix units. So concentration here would be 0.1. The volume would be, well, 20 mil 
is 20 divided by a thousand liters, which would be 0.02. So that's going to give us 0.002. In the equation, we can see there's a ratio of 2 to 1. So our next line would be from the equation. number of moles of sulfuric acid would be 0 0.002 divide by 2, which would be 0 0.001. Okay, now we know the volume of sulfuric acid was 25 mil. So our final thing now is going to be working out the concentration. Now concentration of sulfuric acid will be, concentration is number of moles divided by volume, which would be 0 0.001. Again, remember to put the volume in liters, so 0 0.025 and pop that into a calculator, and there is your concentration. Okay, so again, if you're doing one of these, I would strongly recommend you follow that same step-by-step -step approach. Step one, write the balanced chemical equation. Without that, you don't know the ratio of the two reactants reacting together. Stage two, work out the number of moles of the given substance, the one that you know all the information on, Step three, use that number of moles together with the ratio to get the number of moles of the other one. And then finally, introduce the information that you're given to work out whatever they ask. You looked at titration curves and the different ones that you get when you titrate different strengths of acid against different strengths of base or alkali. And we met the concept of the equivalence point the point where the acid and the alkali cancel each other out completely, where according to stoichiometry, the number of moles obviously of each cancels each other out, okay? We're gonna look at the half equivalence point in this video, because this again is something that you could be tested on. It's something which uh, does kind of get quite popular with the examiners. This will only be for weak acid versus strong base. It could be for a weak base versus strong acid. I've never seen them ask that question, but the concept and the principles are the same. We're going to look at a weak monoprotic acid, HA. Uh, monoprotic means it's got one hydrogen, which you can lose as a proton. Uh, acids like sulfuric, H2SO4, are diprotic, and so on. Easy. So, when HA, a weak monoprotic acid, reacts with a base like NaOH, it'll turn into the salt of that weak acid, sodium. This, this could be ethanoic acid, that would be sodium ethanoate, and water. This is a neutralization reaction. Now then, in this particular reaction, the alkali has been added to the acid, and we are monitoring the pH as we do that. Because it's a weak acid, the pH, let's say that pH there would be about, I don't know, seven, that would probably be about three. Okay, and the strong base eventually would end up about 13. Okay, now then. So the pH will gradually rise, as we know, when you add the alkali, until the equivalence point is reached, where both acid and alkali have now canceled. That will cause a very big pH change with hardly any alkali being added. And this is where the indicator obviously changes colour. The end point of the titration, the point where the indicator changes colour, the indicator's range would be somewhere on that section so that you could see the colour change. That was all dealt with. Okay, now that. The half equivalence point, as the name suggests, if this obviously is the equivalence point, whatever volume is there, then half of that value is the half equivalence point. What's so special about that? Okay, well, if I was to draw a line up there and a line, oh my goodness, excuse my artwork, hopefully you get the idea, okay? So I'm drawing a straight line up and a straight line across. 
where that line meets the pH axis, that pH there is very, very useful to us. Because the weak acid HA, as we know, dissociates to produce H plus ions and A minus ions. Therefore, if I write a Ka for that reaction, I will do this, Ka equals H plus concentration times A minus concentration over HA. That's a pretty neat square bracket. Anyway, those, that's the Ka expression for this, that particular acid dissociating. Okay, now then. at the start of this reaction, at the start, only HA was present, okay? So that was there at the start. At the equivalence point, at the end point of the reaction, this was the only thing present. So only HA at the start, only A minus NAA at the end. At the half equivalence point, half of this has turned into that, and half of it is still HA. What that means is the number of moles of HA and the number of moles of A minus are the same. And since they're in the same volume, their concentrations are the same. So in this equation here, these would now cancel, leaving us with Ka equal to H plus. And if I take negative logs of both sides, then the pKa would equal the pH. So this pH here, let's say that value is 4, is the pKa of this weak acid. Now we may not know what that weak acid is, but, but using a titration curve, we can actually calculate its Ka value. That may not seem like a big deal, but trust me it is, because there are data tables of Ka values, and therefore you could possibly match up an unknown acid with your acid from the data table. Okay, so um, if you want Ka, you've got to do a little bit of maths. We know how to turn a pH into an H+. Plus. It's the same logic here. So if that pH is 4, then effectively the pKa is 4, and therefore the Ka would be 10 to the minus 4. Okay, so half equivalence point, guys. Very, very possible exam question. They do tend to like it, and it could be worth quite a few marks as well because there's a fair bit of understanding needed there. Hopefully, you've got the idea of the equivalence point where the acid and the alkali cancel out completely. But a half equivalence point is where half of it has been reacted to that and half of it hasn't. And when those conditions are met, these two are the same. Ka equals H plus and you can find Ka.